Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable discussion. We are recording today from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, in the United States of America. We're so glad you could join us this morning for our wonderful topic on mind. We will start with our morning prayer. I'm reading from an address in Chicago. It's found on page, it just excerpts from it, uh, page 101 of miscellaneous writings. The science of omnipotence demonstrates but one power, and this power is good, not evil, not matter, but mind. This virtually destroys matter and evil, including sin and disease. If God is all and God is good, it follows that all must be good and no other power, law, or intelligence can exist. On this truth rests premise and conclusion in science and the facts that disprove the evidence of the senses. God is individual mind. Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you. Hey, Karen, the watching point. Watch number 101. Watch lest you strive to put into operation the power of demonstration without seeking to spiritualize your motive. For instance, if you sought the power of God to help you to win a case at law, it would be part of the demonstration to purify your motive so that you could say, quote, not my will, but thine be done, end quote. You cannot call your thought scientific until you do not care which way the verdict is rendered, so long as it is the mind of God that governs and directs it, rather than the will of mortal man. The right application of divine mind is an effort to expose and destroy all belief in a mind apart from God. The harmony that results from this effort will not be a deterrent to spiritual growth, but rather an indication thereof, provided that right thinking is one's goal and the harmony is added unto him, as the Master said, in Matthew 6, 33, and that reads, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, End quote. Attempting to apply God's power with a selfish or human motive tends to perpetuate error and is unscientific mental practice. Thank you. Comments on that? Well, in Doris Henty's book, uh, Christian Addresses and Other Writings on Christian Science, she's, she takes apart, in one of her chapters, she takes apart the Lord's Prayer. And when she talks about thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, that, she says so many wonderful things about the power of the will of God. And one thing that, that I've been working with is that it, it, it asserts the, this mighty will of God is uninfluenced by all the machinations of the so-called human mind. What is the will of God? It is the gentleness of love, insisting upon that which is right and permitting nothing but the right. And then she gives a couple of examples. This irresistible will or power of divine mind as uttered by Jesus. Be thou queen. Arise and walk. Come forth. Stretch forth thine hand. Banished the lie of false belief instantly and finally. Thank you. That's beautiful. Um wasn't sure if I would bring this up, but since we've kind of gone to the Lord's Prayer, I wanted to mention something. Um, my daughter-in-law told me about a book, I guess it's number one, high up on the New York, New York 
the bestsellers. It's, and it's called The Source of Miracles, The Lord's Prayer. And I'm excited about it because now some people uh, are reading about the Lord's Prayer and in this, this little book, and I've only read the first two chapters, it talks about this woman who, uh, well, she had a baby, infant, and at first it seemed fine, but then it didn't. And all its organs and everything, it shut down. And um, But she had visited earlier Notre Dame in Paris and had been so impressed with this beautiful rosette. I guess it's like a tiles, you know, mosaics, and it was a it was a of a rose with six petals. And when she investigated it, and it took a lot of research to find out the meaning behind that, it it had to do with the Lord's Prayer and the verses in the Lord's Prayer and the power of the Lord's Prayer. And then she found out that many, many years ago, Notre Dame, of course, very old, there had been some wonderful teaching going on there about the Lord's Prayer and about other things. Mainly, they've all been lost, but she she researched it as much as she could. And in that research and in that that day that she was there, and at that time she was with child, with this little child, and she was praying for that child, she just felt she had some kind of a vision. And the vision said, don't listen to what anyone says about your baby. Just have faith in God. And it came really, really strongly to her. And so here, fast forwarding, here she's with this little infant who's just about dead. The doctors have said there's absolutely no hope. And even if it, if he were to survive, it would not be good at all. It would be better that he doesn't. And she, because of that vision and this feeling that she had, she refused. She refused to listen to those voices. She refused to do it. And she took that baby. She started praying over that baby. And she could feel the life coming back into him and, and his struggling for life. It, it said something like she looked past all the physical evidence. And, of course, the story is that the child was completely and thoroughly healed. And she is writing now these books. She became a minister because up until that time, she did not believe. You know, she thought, well, Jesus did all these healings, allegories. It didn't really happen, um, but now she knew they did, and she saw the power, the power of this prayer, and she starts the book with something interesting in Easter Sunday, 2007, and I, I don't know, it sounded like maybe this was planned, but she said a third of the world was praying the Lord's Prayer in all different languages everywhere, and she made a point, a very important point, in, and that is that prayer is complete. Think about it. Think of all the religions that say that prayer. It's not changed as it may be, you know, debtors to trespasses or something. But very little is changed. They can't change it. It's perfect. So it is acknowledged. And here she's bringing it to the forefront. And, of course, we know they're not miracles. If they're natural outcomes of, of what this watching point is saying, first seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things are added unto you. But I was happy to see it. I don't know what the rest of the book will be like. People are rethinking it, and she brings out the point, too. Most people just say it. They don't even know what it means. They don't think about it. But here we do, just as that quote from Doris Hinty and and. Mrs. Eddy's spiritual interpretation of it is monumental, so beautiful, so deep. Part of it we talked about on Wednesday. So make sure you reverence this prayer and, and work with it. Mrs. Eddy certainly did, and it has a it highlights it in Science and Health. But the, uh, I thought the prayer that Florence gave us gets back to the most important thing is what is your motive, right? What is your motive for doing anything? What is your motive for praying? What is your motive for doing anything? You, If your motive is love for mankind and love for the truth, 
which is God. Love for life, which is God. Then you will want then you will want whatever is right in God's eyes. If your motive is selfish in any way, then, you know, uh, your, your prayer won't be answered because your prayer is not right. And Mrs. Eddy warns us, doesn't she, that the heart and soul of Christian science is love. It's not the letter of the science, but the spirit of the science. And I think that's what this is getting to. It is the spirit. If we don't have the spirit of love, truth in our heart, the letter of science isn't going to really do us much good. Yeah, and, and most of you know this, but we we were taught a prayer here. You know, you can pray to God, you can ask for something specific, but what do you always end that prayer with? Thy will be done. Yes. Not my will, but thine be done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, might, it might be difficult then when, you know, in a, you say in a court case, you always want to be the one winning or something. But maybe even the, the verdict that goes against you might be for you to learn more. You know, you, you may, so it's always about God's will. What is his will? Because his will cannot be bad for any man. So, well, thank you. Yeah, exactly. And we live in a society where even the guilty are entitled to legal help, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, know, you, you can be a good lawyer, but if you're representing the guilty party, hopefully you will lose the case and mankind will be better off for it. Right? It better be God's will. That's it. If whatever God's will is, we'll bless. I'm sure I, that's what I feel. Well, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, Jesus, when he had to face the cross, said, not my will, but thine be done. Mm-hmm. And it is very important in the Lord's prayer. Uh, it is something, yes, we pray with all the time. And Jeremy, you want to read um, on this last page, the bottom, to the watchers, that he said, Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel, for the Lord our God is one God. You are not to come in your own name to pray. You are not to control any mind. You are to come only in the divine strength and know that God will rule and does and that hypnotism and evil minds cannot and do not control men or governments. All power is God good. This is my formula to Christian scientists for prayer, and God will give you the faith that will remove mountains. Mrs. Yes. Eddie. My, my only formula. So thank you. Absolutely. A powerful prayer in itself. And you see, the only thing to stop the will of God from coming forth is what? Hypnotism, evil minds, the belief mm-hmm. in a power other than God. And that that is what we work to handle. And that's a righteous prayer. You you cut that down so that God's will has free course. You understand yeah. this? Yes. Yeah. It's it's yeah, it's what makes your prayer vital. And you're doing it for yourself. But then in doing it for yourself, you do it for others as well. It clears the atmosphere and purifies the atmosphere. So, and that's true, you know, with all things, whatever it is, upcoming elections, everything. I will be done, Father. Um, I thought this was interesting. I've been studying the Christian Science Practice chapter in Science and Health, which I do a lot, but I... And it was like a random sentence on page 419 where Mrs. Eddy says, Never fear the mental malpractitioner, the mental assassin, who, in attempting to rule mankind, tramples upon the divine principle of metaphysics. For God is the only power. Now, 
where did that come from? I don't know. <laughs> That'll make a really good watch. And it can be a watch for us all to work with. Because when mortal mind goes rampant, that's what they want to do. They want to control mankind. They want to tell you what to do and how to do it. And the antidote to that is knowing that God is the only power. There's no other power. Therefore, this only has a, a elusive power, not the truth. And we mustn't be drawn into believing that it is a power. And we do not have to know who, when, where, and why. Because I know the, our country and maybe others are too are very divided and who is a mental malpractitioner trying to do this. So maybe we don't know, but God knows. God, God's will be done in every instant. No so, better time than this. That's yes, right. One with them. Yes. And, and also then, in in, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, in in Mrs. Eddie's uh, day, um, she says, "Right desire is the f- deepest." form of prayer and that's meaning more to me as I really think about it because that does come down to the right desire is thy will be done and um, nothing it's nothing everything that tries to um, turn or you know upset the will of God is absolutely impossible unthinkable It, it can't be done because God's will is, but that just means more to me now when I read those few words. Right desire is the deepest, that's the deepest form of prayer, she says. Yes. So. And, and, you know, this is why this one statement from Mrs. Eddie or from the Bible or, you know, is so powerful to just get into that and use it. So thank you, yes. Think about that. That means. And one, one other, I, I know I've given this too, but it's important because people ask me about praying, praying for your children or family members or friends. It's First Colossians 1, starting 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It goes on. But the point being, it's a pure prayer. You're not saying, I want so-and-so to be doing this or to stop doing that or to go to a certain school or whatever you want. You're asking that he or she know more of the Father. That's a righteous prayer. That's a beautiful prayer. First Colossians. All right. Um, Nancy, would you read the golden text and then tell us... Yeah. Excuse me. Wrong page. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy time and strength of salvation from Isaiah. And I loved how um, the message of wisdom and knowledge and understanding ran through the whole lesson. Uh, it also in Chronicles, First Chronicles, only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding. And in Second Chronicles, when God appeared unto Solomon and asked him, what shall I give thee? Solomon asked for wisdom and knowledge. And then in Proverbs, for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So I went to the Webster's 1828 dictionary and looked up wisdom. In scripture theology, wisdom is true religion, godliness, piety, the knowledge and fear of God, and sincere and uniform obedience to his commands. This is the wisdom which is from above. Knowledge is learning, illumination of mind, a clear and certain perception of that which exists or of truth and fact. And understanding is comprehending, knowing, the intellectual faculty. It is the faculty by means of which we obtain a great part of our knowledge. 
that faculty whereby we are enabled to apprehend the objects of knowledge and to judge of their truth or falsehood, good or evil. And this is, uh, Eddie writes in miscellaneous writings, men give counsel, but they give not the wisdom to profit by it. And the wisdom of God is the beginning of wisdom. Meekness, moderating human desire, inspires wisdom and procures divine power. And I loved it was abundantly clear to me the importance of daily praying and asking God for wisdom and knowledge and understanding so that I can be obedient to his commands, obtain a clear perception of the truth, and enable me to apprehend or to understand and know what is true and good. Thank you. Yeah, that was beautiful, those definitions. My goodness. Dear Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And how interesting that wisdom is true religion. Mm -hmm. Wow, why, I mean, why wouldn't it be? The wisdom, and it's always from God, right? Wisdom from the high. And that is a beautiful definition of knowledge. That's the true sense of knowledge. Learning mm -hmm. illuminates the mind, a clear and certain perception of that which exists, or of truth, in fact. Because sometimes you can equate knowledge with just what reading and getting on a lot of human human knowledge, which isn't the true sense of it. And then understanding, comprehending. So, and again, it's in this lesson too, where uh, faculty, comprehension, perception are all in mind. So your ability to understand is in God. You're not alone can understand. God gives you that ability to do it. That's why nobody has an excuse. You can't say, oh, I just, I don't understand. Right? Yes. Yes, God. And then in James, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, what do you do? Ask God. Okay. Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. So, you know, you're not wise, ask God. He'll give it to you liberally, just as he did with Okay, To add to what Nancy said, I looked up stability in the golden text, and um, I liked what she said, and, and it said um, it's stability in the 1828, is firmness and steadiness. So that's what gives us our firmness and steadiness is everything that she was talking about, those definitions. It puts us on a firm and steady foundation. Yeah, think of what that means. Stability of thy times. That means with wisdom, if you accept God, you will be personally a stable person. You will have sanity. You will have peace. You will have happiness. You will be trusted by those around you. You, you will have good employment because everybody will, will, will feel your stability and they will respect it. And then as a nation, as a community, if we elect, a, if we elect people, positions, of authority who have wisdom, in other words, who are God-fearing, truly God-fearing, and have wisdom, our community and our nation will have stability and peace. So if we're seeing a lot of drama and violence around us, guess what? Guess why? And what's the answer? The answer turning to God for wisdom God, and understanding. Yeah, to give to give us wisdom to stop all the nonsense. And if we've got people that. if we've got people who are insisting that God isn't real and God should not be in our government and God should not be in our schools, well guess what? 
That that is the warfare. Because there there is no other mind. We have people who are saying, you know, the Constitution should be trashed and replaced with what? Human theory? Human dictators? Hello? (laughs) It's the wrong direction, folks. So that is the warfare that we are involved in right now. Spiritual warfare. And it's way above, you know, political. Um, it's not political parties at all. and all of this stuff. It's not. Yes, because God rules and He does rule His world. We must all be humble enough to acknowledge it. God rules, and it's just going back to God. Oh. I feel. Yeah. We all must go back to Him. Right, and have and have the wisdom to do the right things to vote for the right people, to do all of what we have to do to have a stable and peaceful and prosperous society. And it starts with our individual lives, doesn't it? Yeah. And move mountains. Thank you. And thank you for that definition. Yeah, that's a very important part of that golden text stability. Um, all, all, you know, people that seem to be having all these lows and downs, um, kinds of things going on right now. Because lack of God. And in First Corinthians, for the wisdom is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So we can know, too, that those people who think they can be wise without God is actually foolish. And God will write, will bring it to naught. They'll be taken in their own craftiness. Unless the wisdom is from God. Not, it's not with. In one of the short articles that Carey found in 1922, it says, happy is the man that findeth wisdom. The man who found the pearl was happy. How much more happy is the man who finds wisdom? The world looks on the man of wealth as the man who is to be envied, but the world is mistaken. And with wisdom, who is to be envied, wisdom brings happiness because of the greater work one is enabled to do. Solomon asked for wisdom that he might do his work better. The ability to do things well <clears throat> brings a satisfaction that nothing else will bring. <clears throat> Excuse me. The possession of wisdom also brings happiness because we know we have something that cannot be taken away from us. The man of wealth has something today that may be gone tomorrow, but the man with wisdom has something that will always be his. It also brings happiness. Because if we have the true wisdom, we are brought nearer to God. We know God better. And that can bring a happiness that nothing else can. Wisdom will always be priceless. And that is, you know, what is that? Oh, Proverbs is full of how priceless wisdom is. It sought more after than finest jewels and gold. Wisdom of God. All right, anyone else who wanted to say anything? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I was thinking about that story this week and about how an additional piece of wisdom that Solomon needed was to make sure everyone knew that that wisdom was coming straight from God. So instead of people traveling far and wide to see and hear Solomon, they knew they were traveling to hear what God had to say Mm -hmm. and not his life would have gone a little bit better, I think. <laughs> so it's a, it's a good reminder. Give God the glory. Thank you very much so. Every time you get too full of yourself, then things go down very rapidly, don't they? <laughs> mm-hmm. But you can't really gain the wisdom and knowledge of God without humility. 
So you got to have that first <laughs> before you can even, you know, gain God's wisdom and knowledge. You, you have to, you have that, that humility has to come first. Yeah. How can you be given wisdom when you're already full, so full of yourself? Yeah, exactly. Could I say something? Certainly. You know, without humility, because it's, humility is what we need for everything. It's uh, the love that is needed to understand. And with humility, we're saying, God, you take me all the way, not part of the way. Thank you. And, and Solomon started with a good humility, didn't he? He, he yeah. you know, when God asked him what he wanted, he said, "I just want understanding, wisdom, so that I can be a good, do a good job for you." And yeah, and then, and things worked out very well. He built the, uh, you know, he built the the temple. Uh, and he, you know, the, the land was uh, relatively peaceful, you know. The, their enemies respected what was going on. They could see that, there, that, the, that the God of Israel was actually doing something wonderful, and they respected that. But uh, what tripped up Solomon was he began to be enamored of the results instead of instead of keeping his humility and recognizing this was all God's doing thought maybe he was doing something and don't we see that around us there are people who start out humbly in life and accumulate and, are, and become successful at whatever they do and, you know, you see it in the Christian science churches. People become healthy, they become wealthy, and then they start worshiping their wealth instead of God, and they lose it. Oh, yes. Yeah, and it's something we very careful about when we become that healthy. That reminds me. It reminds me of the story of Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Giving him, you know, all the surround all that he was surrounded with, thinking it was all him and boy did he have a wake up call. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Florence, did you want to No, I said, you know, people then think that they did it. It's something that they came up with. That's why. But it's all from God. Where is the source? We have, we cannot forget the source. The source from where all good comes from. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's in the Bible. I was reading in Leviticus, which <laughs> says exactly that. You know, when you see who I am and what I am and give me the credit and whether God's before you, everything will be. But if you don't, it'll go down very rapidly. So individually, as a nation. Um, yeah, always keep that humility. Yeah, Solomon certainly got off course, fortunately. But he started out, yes, with that humility. That's why I guess we have to constantly be checking ourselves. Um, and that's, it was in it was in the watch message recently about in Science and Health where Mrs. Betty says, hold perpetually this thought. That it is the divine idea, the Holy Ghost, the Christ, which enables you with scientific certainty to prove the divine principle, love, underlying, overlying, encompassing all true being, that hold perpetually to this thought, that it is not you that's doing the healing work, paraphrasing, but hold perpetually, don't ever think it's you. It does anything. Always, if it's good, it's God. If it's not good, then you were listening to uh, supposition, belief in 
So anyway, we all need to be be, be uh, alert that when, when we become healthy, we don't become proud of our health. We don't become proud of our repaired bodies. When we become wealthy, we don't become proud of what we own. <laughs> Yeah, don't become a cautionary tale. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, and Mrs. Eddie was such a beautiful example of that, wasn't she? That, that's why I love Lawrence's article about visiting Chestnut Hill and seeing Mrs. Eddie's bedroom. Great, right, Lawrence. But yeah, it's unfortunate that so many still believe this lie about her, that she was a money-grabbing woman and all this. I, it, it's really kind of sad. They should see <laughs> her room. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very modest. She didn't want a lot, and she called that chestnut, chestnut view as blended misery. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. This was something that Carrie sent I thought was interesting about the Queen of Sheba. It was a reading and got questions about the Queen of Sheba, and it indicated that Jesus referred to the Queen of Sheba as the Queen of the South in Matthew 12. To illustrate a point, and then, quote, despite being originally pagan in belief and Gentile in faith, the Queen of Sheba recognized the truth and reality of God unlike the religious leaders who opposed Jesus, end quote. And this is hugely important. And again, we see this in The Chosen. It was the religious leaders who opposed him. All the, the world around, people would accept who and what he was. That was the true wisdom. And then this is Matthew twelve forty two, which is, you know, New Testament. The Queen of the South, shall rise up in the judgment with ju this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. She, she loved and she respected this wisdom of Solomon, didn't she? She was taken with it and... In this, you know, we we watch sometimes our movie night. There's Bible series, and one was about Solomon, and it it made an interesting take on the story where it said he he loved Queen of Sheba. That she she was the one he truly loved, and he did have a son by her who uh, reigns in Ethiopia, I think, to this day. The lineage of him. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to say anything, Florence? No. I mean, he, he does have the lineage. Um, Haley Selassie, uh, I believe, has that lineage too. Haley Selassie was uh, one of the Ethiopian rulers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Direct line from Solomon. Um, but he was not allowed to to marry her because she wasn't a Jew, I guess. Uh, all these laws and things. But and and in this movie, mm -hmm. it says that this is what what set him off. After that, he was just so mad about all of this that he began having all these concubines and other women and just became kind of destitute. It was an interesting take on that story. Who knows? Who knows what really happened? Made me have a little more compassion for him anyway. <laughs> so. <laughs> all right. Um, Shardell, do you want to share what you've sent to me? Yes, I was very interested that heart was mentioned so many times in our lesson. And that when I started to look around, it's mentioned all over the Bible. So I looked it up again in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and I'll just share a few of the things about heart. The chief part, the seed of understanding, character, courage, disposition of mind, strength tenderness or affection, purpose or intention. And, we thought, and it gives you a lot. I really thought a lot about that, your heart. And, and where does it go? Thine great heart of, 
of thou infinite, infinite heart of love, right. the great heart of infinite love. love. Yeah, thou great heart is enough to comfort mine. It's very beautiful heart. Yes, yes. and it does. In responsive reading, it talks about praise, praise the Lord with your whole heart. And, you know, when your heart is right with God, uh, thing is right too, including your, you'll know how important wisdom is. It kind of all goes together. All the synonyms go together. Ruth. Go together. All right, and and Sharon, did you send? <clears throat> I did <clears throat> Science and Health, page 263. Mortals must look beyond fading finite forms if they would gain the true sense of things. And fading, losing color, becoming less vivid, decaying, declining, withering. Finite, having a limit, limited, bounded, opposed to infinite. Forms, the shape or external appearance of a body, the figure, as defined by lines and angles. Fading finite forms are mortal mind appearance, animal magnetism. They are not real, eternal, or of God. War is a battle between good and evil. Recession is the act of receding from a plane or of relaxing a demand. The belief God does not meet our every need. Drought is not lack of rain, but animal magnetism. The only weather there is, is divine weather, controlled by God and neither too little or too much. And then Bicknell Young in 1936 primary class says, everything that is evil is mesmeric belief, animal magnetism. Realize that nothing is going on but good. End quote. Fading finite forms are temporary because they are not of God and cannot stand. Change your belief and understand God is all and the mes mesmeric beliefs disappear. Thank you. Very good. Where, where did that then first, wasn't that also from Bicknell Young, the recession and all of that, drought? Where did that come from? I don't know. I had it written on a piece of paper, um, <laughs> my files, and I didn't have an author. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Well, it's it's good to realize that this is it. Uh, you look beyond that. You see, that's what that mother did when she was holding her infant. She looked beyond that picture to the truth, and that that true picture brought it into being. So this is what we do. We look beyond those fading forms, finite, gain what's true. So anyone comment on that? Thank you for that, Sharon. So this lesson, you know, is so full of how we can hear and see and feel all that's good through through mind. Um and I love those citations, page 84 in Science and Health. When sufficiently advanced in science to be in harmony with the truth of being, men become seers and prophets involuntarily, controlled not by demons, spirits, or demigods, but by the one spirit. And it is the prerogative of the ever-present divine mind and of thought which is in rapport with this mind to know the past, the present, and the future. And those words, um, rapport, is a close, harmonious relationship. So when you have a close, harmonious relationship with your father, mother, God, you will know all these things that you need to know. You will be demonstrating your oneness. And it's, oh, it's a, well worth working for. You don't have to try to do it. It will be. It will come to you involuntarily because it's divine and not human. 
we cannot forget also that every function of the real man is governed by the divine mind. I love that. That's it. And then, again, somehow that mother with that little baby that that came to her, maybe she didn't know exactly what was going on, but functions that it that it stopped infant began because that's the truth. And you see, here we have the science of what healed that child. It wasn't just focus, focus. We have the science of what was done. And I mean, we just be so everlastingly grateful. And this is Eddie. Because when she refused to accept the verdict of the doctors, he was really acknowledging the allness of God, wasn't she? And when we refuse to accept the testimony of the material senses, so-called, when we refuse to accept the negative, the drama, that is what we do when we acknowledge the allness of God. And then our response of reading Know, there's all of the things that the works of the they're great, they're honorable, they're glorious. They stand forever and ever. They're done in truth. This is all the result of the fact that God is all there is. We have to get back to that one basic truth. Yeah, and, and- so what Gary was saying about the woman with the infant, she refused. She was, she was indignant that these doctors were telling her these things about her child. She was not going to listen to it. She shut it entirely, that wrong voice telling her with authority because they were doctors. Well, she wasn't listening. Sorry, not listening. That wasn't true. That wasn't what she had been told. She'd been told to have faith and that her child would be all right. And we must have that faith, and we must know whatever the situation is, whatever air is telling us. It's not the truth. Not listening. I will not listen. I will hear voices. I will heed no other call. Evil of every sort, and it will flee from you. Yes. They're all patient. No, I was saying it's like the Shunammite woman, you know, she saw the ch- the child is what dead? No, 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 no. I'm going to go to the fan of God. And he she did and was raised up. It's all well. Yes, it is well. It is well. Yeah. So, so this we must do and seeking the this is seeking wisdom. And this is the wisdom of God. And it is the wisdom that heals. It will heal any any situation, any problem. So Gary's now going to end on a, another article from um, here. On the- this is an uh, article entitled Choose the Best by Bertha V. Zarega from the 1923 journal. This is an excerpt. About the ages, mankind has been daily and hourly choosing, being upon the choice made. About the ages, whether men realized it or not, this choice has always been between thoughts and desires which led towards spirituality through happiness, life, and harmony, and those which led away from it into materiality, error, and discord. Moses said to the Israelites, I have set before you life and death. Choose life, that both you and and that both thou and thy seed may live. Whenever the choice of this people was governed by willing obedience to the divine principle and the rule of the divine law which Moses so patiently taught them, they were, without fully realizing it, Choosing life, peace, and abundant supply of all good. 
When Solomon was asked what God should give him, he chose wisdom, a higher understanding of God. And in consequence, he was granted not only a wise and understanding heart, but both riches and honor, and added to this the promise of long life. Mrs. Eddy says in the First Church of Christ Scientist in Miscellany, page 165, quote, of two things fate cannot rob us, namely, of choosing the best and of helping others We choose the best when we follow our leader's instruction and example given in these inspiring words in the Polanyus Writings, page 154, quote, Strive for self-abnegation, justice, meekness, mercy, purity, love. Let your light reflect light. Have no ambition, affection, nor aim apart from holiness. And further on, she says, quote, Sacrifice self to bless one another, even as God has blessed you. Forget self in laboring for mankind. Then will you woo the weary wanderer to your door, win the pilgrim and stranger to your church, and find access to the heart of humanity, end quote. We help others to make their choice between matter and spirit as we embody in our own lives the spiritual qualities herein outlined by our leader and strive to purify our thinking to such a degree that all who are looking for the light or longing for relief from material bondage may find inspiration and encouragement through our example to forget those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Press for the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. End quote. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.